it was a beautiful day and everything went like clockwork and i dropped the first bomb i think your dad called up and says hey you got the pin this is going to clear take off left hand take off left Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies podcast. I'm PR Ganapati, your host. Well, welcome back to part two of my interview with Group Captain Ajit Akte. In the first part of the interview, we spent most of our time discussing his early career his action during the 1971 war his journey of becoming an instructor and instructing in Iraq and as we left off he had just been selected for the test pilots course and so today we're going to spend almost an hour discussing his journey and career as a test pilot and uh, we'll start off by asking him how he was selected welcome back to the program sir thanks very much ganesh how was selection for test pilot school at your time did you volunteer were you nominated there was no selection for this course they just posted guys in <laughs> and here i was so kicking and screaming i came to bangalore so you must have been quite senior relative to the other student test pilots isn't it i was i already had 12 years of service <laughs> so anyway that kind of helped me because i had a lot of flying experience and uh, and i had two school going children which the others did not have right so anyway it was good fun and as i said 24 hours were 24 hours too short and the course went off at its standard pace which is breakneck pace and in october i think your dad took over as our boss and uh, he was uh shall i say the father of project darren or the conceiver of project darren but he was in it from day one and what he didn't know was not worth knowing right and it and i did my preview on which is the last exercise on the test pilot course on the jaguar so i automatically moved on as the project pilot for project darren and wow. 8th of December 1982 the first uh, prototype is a wrong word but the first developed aircraft JS102 did its first flight and your dad did the first flight yeah. on that aircraft and sortie 8 onwards he handed it over to me and from then on i took it all the way through to initial operations clearance and setting up the first squadron you know, oh that perhaps has been the shall i say most satisfying one learning two and the very very eye opening experience because i would never ever have got this kind of exposure had i not been in the project so i just want to talk about being a test pilot who are who are test pilots what do they do what is training to be a test pilot like and how is it different from the sort of training and flying that you'd been doing previously how did you change gears and what are some of those changes you needed to make okay typically as you hear the word test pilot it gives you the idea that you go up to test an aircraft well yes but uh, in the old days people said oh you went up and tested and you found how things were but uh, when we came to test pilot school we found that was not the case when any new development happens be it on the aeroplane or on a system that is going on to the aircraft or or a new weapon to be used on the aircraft first thing is you disc- it the whole project is laid down threadbare 
and systematically you move about it. If it is a weapon, how the weapon is going to be attached, what is going to be the effects of it. All the theoretical part, things are jotted down. Today we've reached a stage where you can virtually predict what is going to happen and then you go about doing it. So flight testing, we realized, is not just go up, fly, see how things behave, come back and jot down and write your notes. No, you decide on a small area that you're going to go on, then systematically you decide how you're going to record all that data. To record all that data, you ask for instrumentation of the aircraft. In the old days, you had recorders which would record on a photo tape. Then came the next stage where things became digital and you started recording a lot more parameters because they were digitally recorded and you could record them on a tape. Now you've gone to a stage where that data gets recorded on a chip, but all that data is recorded on the aircraft. Today we've reached a stage where all this data can be radioed down and that process is called telemetered down. This entire data can be telemetered down. In addition to this, the aircraft parameters get telemetered down. So the flight test engineers who are sitting on consoles watching things happen, if they find that whilst you're testing something, if they find there's a hydraulic leak on that aircraft and the hydraulic system is dropping pressure, quickly they tell you, hey, stop, this is what is happening, come back or stop, recover, fly straight and level, switch off some system which will prevent the leak and so on and so forth. So today flight testing has graduated to that level. So testing came along for, with testing comes first theoretical studies. So theoretical studies mainly to be able to understand what is the system, how you're going to test it, how you're going to take it step by step all the way up to the limit that you have to take it. And it is always done one teeny weeny minuscule step at a time and when you're satisfied you're right then you go to the next step so that if should something go wrong you know whatever has gone wrong is only in this last step and not in the previous steps but so that involves a lot of study involves a lot of innovation also in the sense that if you've got to decide how you're going to test it you have to sit together with the test engineer discuss and then decide what kind of instrumentation you need to be able to record it. Then go and do just that. Nothing more, nothing less. Come back, get all the data, put the data into various formats that you want, rig it up, see together, see that you've achieved what you wanted to, and then move to the next step. So switching gears, well, it did involve a little bit of switching gears. So those happy-go-lucky days, hey, we'll go and see what happens. They're finished. But it was good fun and learned a lot. And having learned that, I did the preview on the Jaguar. The preview is an exercise where you get to test an aircraft which you've never seen before. So you've got to go to the base where the aircraft is based. For the exercise purpose, for the, for the course, it is at the base on which the aircraft is within the country. This will lead you up to, say, having to go and evaluate an aircraft abroad. So you go there, you get three or four days to do ground subjects training. You get your books, you study, you go to the ground school, get all the data from the instructors and so on. And when you're ready, you get two trips with an instructor. And thereafter, you decide on what role you've been told to assess this aircraft for. For that role, you already have decided on the tests that you're going to do, which have been discussed at base with both the flying instructors and the engineer instructors. And then you go there and you do just those tests, gather that data, come back here, sit, analyze that data, put it together, and you get 10 days to write a report, which you write, which is called a preview. So I did that on the Jaguar, and, uh, and it was at that time when the... Darren Jaguar was coming up. So I moved into with that project. So just uh, if we can back up a little bit, the, what was the Jaguar kind of originally designed for? 
what did it evolve into what did the indian air force get it for and uh, you know how, what was what was the, its role that it was procured for okay uh sometime around the mid 70s or maybe early no it was just about the mid 70s around 74 75 that a replacement for a canberra was required canberra was a classic bomber and everybody felt that the era of classic bombers was over and so they wanted a fighter bomber high altitude open a bomb bay drop a whole bunch of dumb bombs yeah they wanted a low altitude deep penetration strike aircraft that was the nomenclature under which these aircraft were evaluated dpsa dpsa was a very widely touted term in the mid and late 70s stood for deep penetration strike aircraft the three aircraft evaluated were the jaguar the wigan and the mirage f1 the mirage f1 was also a very good aircraft met every requirement only it was a single engine aircraft so also a wigan but the wigan besides being single engine aircraft ran into some more problems because uh, some of its major components and i think the engine came from the americans and at that point in time you know what the relationship india had with the americans so there was no question of going in for anything that had american so it finally boiled down to the jaguar which also happened to be a twin engine aircraft and what is the importance of twin engines in this sort of dpsa mission if it is going to be a low level aircraft predominantly a uh, low level strike aircraft chances of hitting a bird etc are bright should you lose an engine you don't want to lose an aircraft so you must have a second engine which will allow you to return on one engine well okay. it's a sound philosophy it's used today large most fighters in fact are twin engine aircraft though there are single engine aircraft also and the americans who were the big foreigners of twin engine aircraft have an equal number of single engine aircraft flying so that single engine versus twin engine battle will continue but yes twin engine does offer twin engine a single engine survivability which a single engine aircraft does not give wonderful and so for this preview where did you go where did you, which base did you go to where was the jaguar? i went to ambala ambala was the home Back. of the jaguar i use the word was because it's no longer the home of jaguar the rafale has turfed the jaguars out <laughs> and so ambala was ambala was the home of the jaguar so that's where i went and i did this work of the jaguar and came back so describe your first time you saw the aircraft and flew it what is it like oh there are quite a few things which are so different uh, for about 25 years the indian air force had not got an aircraft from the western world no sorry 25 is a wrong term may uh, 57 yeah about 22 years or so and we had this love affair with the russian aircraft and everything that came in was soviet and the complete philosophy was different the aircraft was built differently made differently and things were once again so user friendly the books that came to us were in language we understood unlike the russian books which were which was russian translated to english by a language interpreter so you had terms like when you vigorously deflect the rudder energetically pull back on the stick <laughs> which was <laughs> which was so classic of the soviet aircraft wasn't there the books were written in language which you were so used to that is written in the same language in which the hunter the nat and the canberra books were written so we were so used to it right. and uh, so that was so easy to understand besides the flying qualities there's no doubt that the control harmony and flying qualities of british aircraft have always been very very good the hunter was a sheer delight and this came next to the hunter whereas the russian aircraft were a little heavy crude so that was different the cockpit layout was different the instrumentation was new and what was so good was this was the first aircraft with a inertial navigation attack system and a head up display this was the very first aircraft with that 
But this inertial nav attack system and the head up display was called NAVVAS, N-A-W-N-A-V-W-A-S-S. Navigate NAV stood for Navigation Weapon Aiming Subsystem. This was the first generation which had electromechanical gyros and so on. And this, as it is when the British were giving it to us or when we were buying it from the British, this system was on its way out. And how, I mean, we were offered what the British themselves were going to go in for. They were going in for a system called FIN 1094, FIN 1094, which stood for Ferranti Inertial Navigation 1094. But the details of why we did not opt for it and why we went in for what we did are, they're no longer classified, but I think your dad is in a far better position to tell you. But essentially, it was this, that we were going to play no role in the development of that system. We were just going to pay money for the development. Instead, the Air Force decided we would develop it ourselves. And so they set up an organization called IIO. The first I stood for INAS, Inertial Nav Attack System, Integration Organization. So this is uh, Atma Nirbar 1.0, you can say. You can call it that. And then they decided what name should we give it. And so people were thinking of inertial nav attack, nav displays. It came to something like Indra. I think your dad was the one who scuttled it. He said, no way. <laughs> he said, it will give it political overturns. <laughs> right. Oh, that's right. She was uh, prime minister, perhaps. <laughs> and so she was the prime minister. And so he, I think it was he who coined this word. He said, display, attack, ranging inertial navigation. That's it. The system was going to give you good displays. It's an attack system. It is using various sensors for ranging and inertial navigation. So that's how it became display attack ranging inertial navigation. If you can explain in the deep penetration role particularly, why is such a system so critical to the effectiveness of the aircraft? And in deep penetration, you say low, but what do you mean by low? Okay, so I'll answer your second question first. Low is low, really low, not above 200 feet above ground level. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh low is low, really low, 200 feet. Every, as the saying goes that if you went up to 1,000 feet on a Jaguar, you got hypoxia. So, <laughs> so Jaguar does its strike at 200 feet and the maritime Jaguars over the sea do their strike transits at 80 feet. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that is low. That So we train for that. Over land, 200 feet. Over sea, 80 feet. And at that altitude, you don't have a chance to pick up any sort of landmarks or do any sort of other navigation. And that's why a navigation attack system becomes so critical. Is that right? It is. It is difficult navigating, yes. But technology was moving in leaps and bounds. And today you've got systems which take you on a track plus minus a few feet across the track. So what happens is your attention and concentration on navigation that you was your concentration, which was solely taken up for navigation and accurate navigation can now be used for everything else. That is keeping the sky around you clear, keeping your lookout clear and so on and concentrate on accurate weapon delivery. So if you can navigate so accurately, you use the same system to give you data to your weapon aiming computer to drop a weapon more accurately. So if where at the end of a strike, errors of 25 yards were acceptable, you needed say something like 12 aircraft to go and hit a target to get the desired results. With better quality of accuracy, you need fewer aircraft to do that. Maybe you can achieve the same results with only four. 
So eventually that is the aim to reduce what is called on target requirement, which means the number of aircraft that you wish to send on target and the number of bombs that you wish to drop on target. Now, if you can drop a dumb bomb within five meters accuracy, you need far fewer weapons. And you, therefore, you need far fewer aircraft. So you can use the same assets for multiple targets and re or reduce your exposure to terminal defenses to a fewer aircraft. So inertial, the only way you found you needed a accurate navigation system. The reason you can't use radio based navigation systems, which were all available there, is the first thing that happens in war is everyone switches off the radio. Yes, so, yeah. Yeah. Because if you can use it, somebody else can use it. Right. If you can use, say, a VOR to navigate, which is a VHF Omni range, so can the enemy. That is one. And if it is transmitting, it can be countermeasured to give you incorrect information. So both these things can happen. So the first thing that happens is all radio aids get switched off. So now you're without radio aids. So how do you navigate without radio aids? Inertial navigation is the only thing. The only thing you can, only way you can corrupt inertial navigation data is when you shoot it out. No other way. So you're autonomous, completely autonomous. So the inertial platform, as I said, for this, this is the need to navigate accurately. Having navigated accurately and you reach your target, you need a system which will enable you to drop an accurate bomb on a first pass attack, which means you plan your attack direction in such a way that your last 15 to 20 miles are in your attack direction. You settle down on the attack direction, you come screaming in, drop your weapon and out without stepping up at all. You don't step up to acquire the target. You don't step up to get your firing conditions right. You get your firing conditions right at your initial point. And your final run in from initial point to target is done at your attack positions. Your attack height and your attack speed, you drop your weapon and continue. And the reason you need to do it low was because you wanted to evade radar. You wanted to evade radar for two reasons. One is advance warning to the enemy. Two is the same radar information is used by surface to air weapons. You wanted to deny that information. So therefore you remained low. And so when you are so low, the earliest he could get you was when you were between say 20 miles to 18 miles. That gave him no more than two and a half minutes reaction time. And that is not enough to be able to feed that information into the weapon aiming computers of the surface to air weapons. And therefore you had a reasonable chance of being able to sneak out un unhindered. That was the whole reason why you wanted un to stay low. Deep penetration is because you want to hit targets deep in enemy territory and come back. This was the reason you needed deep penetration strike aircraft. So when we got the Jaguar, we were getting it with a system which was already outdated. And the Royal Air Force was going in for a better system, which we said, since we had no role to play in it, we decided we'd go in for this and develop it ourselves. There were a lot of skeptics. People said, how are you going to do it? And so on. And the way it was done is you took the heart of the system, which was the inertial platform from a company called Sajem. Sajem was a French company. They had huge experience in accurate navigation. All the Airbus aircraft came equipped with Sajem platforms. So they had massive experience in navigation, but they had no experience in attack competition. And experience is what? The theory they can work out, but where are they going to get flight test results from? So the deal was, we'll give this to you, you flight test, and naturally the results are shared. The display the head up display came from smiths and that was going to be the backup as a weapon aiming computer for the primary system which was such a now here was a french company and there was a company from england from cheltenham they had to be able to talk to each other then for the 
head down display was the first multifunction display which was a called which was called the comet combined map and electronic display so the map was projected on a screen the screen was also a cathode ray tube which had, so it could give you electronic display superimposed on it and this was given by smiths of sorry by ferranti of edinburgh scotland and they wanted flight test data because they were gunning for this to go into the f18 hornet wow. so everybody had a stake in it sajam wanted flight test data to be able to give attack computations for the later versions of the mirage 2000 and the rafal ferranti wanted this information flight test information to be able to develop the comet for the uh, hornet f18 so these being the stakes they were deeply involved in it and discussions went on between india and the uk and france and all that happened and finally this came about and the way they were going to talk to each other was via a data bus that was the first time a data bus was introduced on military airplanes in india and this was the mil specification 1553 which was loosely called the 1553 data bus so right. the mil standard 1553 data bus is what is used and they set it up and we started flying to put it in one word it was something unbelievable out of this world the data was good quality the display was better quality both head up and head down so all that was involved now was to fly this aircraft flight test it tweak it and develop it so we started off so phase one was navigation to see if i can go from place a to b correctly or not sajam had huge experience so they were very confident the navigation will breeze through but this had to be integrated with the head down display this display had to be integrated with the head up display and so all that work began it began in great earnest at that time everybody was bugged with one thing that the inertial nav attack system on the old jaguar used to give a lot of trouble in hot weather in ambala this has to perform in hot weather hot weather hot weather hot weather hot weather so i had reached a stage of confidence by about april or may to say yes it's working fine now let's subject it to the hot weather temperatures so ambala and Rajasthan was the place where we, could, where we could take it. So we took it there. And the temperatures were nice and hot, 38 to 40 degrees and climbing. <laughs> On day one, I took off. And all these sorties were flown at 200 feet. And the sortie durations used to be in the order of 1 hour 45 minutes to 2 hours 15 minutes. And the total distance traversed was in the order of 1,000 nautical miles. My so goodness. there I was hanging around all over out of RT radio contact with everybody came back and there was a huge thunder shower on at Ambala <laughs> so there was panic galore hey can, can you come back here so I came back I landed in a pouring thunder shower and we switched off and the temperature dropped to 19 degrees so <laughs> <laughs> So much for your hot weather testing. <laughs> so much for hot weather. <laughs> and so, so for the next two days, the temperatures gently started climbing to 25, 27, then 35, 37. So we sat there twiddling our thumbs, waiting for temperatures to go, go up all over again. <laughs> but it performed, it performed beautifully, there's no doubt about it. So can you give me some sense for uh, you know between the navwas system and the and the darren system you know on navigation parameters uh yeah you know, how much would that be off by versus how much was this off by if if you can share that sort of data yes yes of course the navwas uh, had a huge big fat uh, i mean computer itself was a big fat guy and it was all stored in the nose so the nose of the darren system aircraft externally there was no change whatsoever internally they'd cut up everything and 
these components were put in. These components were smaller in size, and so there was a lot of room available there. They consumed far less cooling power. They didn't need so much cooling as the older system needed. But the fans for cooling were the same, so there was adequate cooling available. Then inside the cockpit, what happened was the, the main navigation and attack panel came chin up. So it was mounted chin up. So that is a major difference. So you did not have to look down to make any changes. You were looking up and out while you could make changes with your left hand. Because you're flying at 200 feet and you don't want to, you don't yes. want to look inside to look for too inside. long. Absolutely right. Yeah. So that was the main thing that happened. Then the entry method on the NAVAS was very cumbersome. You behind, we, inside the cockpit, beyond the throttles, was a hand controller, which had two buttons. It had an eyeball controller for slewing uh, data on the head-up display, and it had a couple of buttons with which you had to keep playing around to change the display. And you had to keep clicking it to change the display by one digit at a time. Having reached that figure, you had to press a trigger, it would accept that, then move on to the next. It was a very, very painful process. But there was no choice. So this head-up controller, or not head-up, but the chin-up controller was a very straightforward, press the correct button and enter. So that made a huge difference. And that rendered that hand controller virtually surplus, but it was used for some other requirements, which I'll just talk about. That was the first change. The head down display was a projected map. The maps came in different scale. I mean, you, you had the ability to put maps in different scales. We had the million, the half million, the quarter million, one eighth and the one inch map, which you needed depending upon the phase of flight. If you were doing plane high level ferry, you could go to the million map. But if you were doing your initial point, your IP to target run, initial point to target run, you needed a one inch map, which you could get. All you had to do was push the buttons, the correct scale, and get it. And the display, the electronic display of the track being drawn and all was electronically drawn. And that was shown, on, which was most comfortable. This was the very first and first generation multifunction display that came in into the Indian Air Force. I'm not too sure if any aircraft had this kind of a thing before this, because the Hornet got the same thing. In fact, if you see some pictures of the old Hornet F-18A and B, they have the comet in there. In fact, they got two of these guys wow. in there. So try, try. that was good. And then the head-up display. The head-up display came with the capability of a raster display, which means a radar display could also be put on to superimpose. We needed that because the maritime version was going to have the radar. And so that radar had to be, the radar display had to be put on. So that radar display could be put head up and head down it went on to the comet. So these were the big, big, big changes. This was a complete, shall I say, one generation removed from the previous one. So it was good fun working on this. So as I said, first to prove the accuracy of the heart of the system on navigation. Once that was proved, it gave us a level of confidence that look, if this can be if this is being done accurately, it is the same data that gets fed to the weapon aiming computer in addition to some vertical data which comes off the radio altimeter or with the laser. Once you have your horizontal data, which the navigation system gives, and the vertical data, which either the radar altimeter or the laser is going to give, that's all you need then. After that, it's only a question of integration of this data to give you a good weapon aiming solution. So. So we were very confident that it would drop accurate bombs. So we had a French flight test engineer, a guy by the name of Daniel Delbasse. He was based here permanently. The fat bounder used to say, I'm a Frenchie. I have to go and have my lunch, which meant two bottles of wine and lunch and so on and so forth. So before he went for lunch, he had to see me off. Then he went for lunch, <laughs> came back. So the... Weapons were going to be dropped at a place called Shrihari Kota. You don't mind if I take a few minutes to describe that in Please, some sir. detail? 
Now, Srihari Kota, as you know, is in news now in big, big, big bold letters and in golden letters. But that's where the satellites are being launched. We chose that because of the satellite launch facility. The reason for it is because when the satellites are launched, they are tracked by an equipment called the kinetheodolites, which people call cinetheodolites, kinetheodolites, you can call them what you want. But right. what they do is they track and film a satellite. So we said that's exactly what we want done. You track the aeroplane. And so that when you track the aeroplane, I get an independent ground-based observation of a point in space where I was. When I say space, I mean both lat long for my horizontal thing and how much above the ground for my vertical displacement. Then I, from there, I know exactly how far I am from the target. If I know that happens at weapon release, then this data gets taken backwards and you pull the same data out from the aircraft instrumentation and you compare the two data. And now you compare this to say under these conditions of speed, height, angle of attack, angle of side slip, and so on, you need to be at so many feet away from the target for your bomb to go. The ground-based data tells you where you were in true space. The inertial data tells you were as worked out by the system. And then you compare the two. And if there is an error, that error has got to be removed. And then you know you're correctly positioned. So that's why we had to do this. As a backup to this, we used the old method of what was called photogrammetry, which means you put markers at various distance. Each marker has a different marking, so you know exactly which marker is at what distance, which is filmed from the head-up display, which has its weapon aiming solution also on it. So you know its dimensions of this target you know the angle at which you're looking at it. So at a particular distance, that target will subtend a certain angle. So once you get this program worked out, you can put it and project it. And this is the third method of working out to see where exactly you were with relation to the target. With this, we started off for the initial clearance. The deal was that we must clear two practice bombs, one a free fall bomb, one a bomb dropped to the level at low level, so which is called a retard bomb. The reason you need to retard a bomb is because the aircraft is flying at a certain speed, so the bomb is at the same speed. Now, when you release the bomb, the bomb has the same speed. So theoretically, it will keep flying with you, but you don't want that to happen. Especially when you are as low as 200 feet as 200 feet because then when it explodes it's right below you so you want this bomb to retard very rapidly so for a big bomb you put a parachute for the practice bomb they have little rings attached to it so the bomb retards very rapidly so the moment it retards it points its nose down and goes and impacts the ground wires whilst the aircraft flies away so the deal was that we needed it cleared with one free fall practice bomb one free fall retard bomb, one free fall live thousand pounder, one retard live thousand pounder, guns and rockets. These were the six weapons to be cleared for the stage, which has been going around in the newspapers now related to the Tejas IOC. That right. initial operations clearance. And yeah. the gap between IOC to FOC is the final operations clearance where you get all the other fancy weapons and so on. Right. But with this much, if you have this much, they said, the first squadron can form up and start flying the aircraft, which, is a, which everybody does. That's a sensible thing to do. So we started off by drop, doing only dummy drops. Now, how does the kinetheodolite know that you have dropped a weapon? So he's tracking you all the while. He doesn't know on a dummy pass when the weapon has gone because he can't see it go. Yeah. So you have a side tone, a radio generated side tone, so that you put on the tone and it goes all the while. The moment you drop the weapon, it stops. 
So that's the point at which the drop has taken place. Now this tone gets recorded on his camera film. It gets recorded on my camera film. The way it's recorded is on the camera film of the aircraft is you get a flash. So you know the frame that it has happened. He gets a similar indication. So that's how you know that the weapon drop is taken place. So I used to go from here to Sri Arikota. So the engineer rightly said you're going traveling 120, I don't know, 100 some 140 odd miles from here to there. So you take readings on the way. It will update our data for nav system performance. You do the same on the way back. And over the range, you do what has to be done. So it used to take me 20 minutes to go there, 20 minutes to return. That was 40 minutes and 45 minutes over there. So it used to be 85 minutes sortie plus some takeoff landing and the rest of it. So it was between 1 hour 30 to 1 hour 45. Now Sri Hari Kota does not, so it was 20 minutes of transit time out, 20 minutes of transit time back. That was 40 minutes. And I used to get between 45 to 50 minutes on the range. So it was 90 minutes and circuit approach landing and so on and so forth. It would be a one hour, 45 minutes flight. Now, Shrihari Kota has got nothing to do with Ministry of Defense. There is so. So MOD versus everyone else is like India versus Pakistan or everyone else versus MOD is. So they said, we'll give you a time from 1400 hours to 1500 hours. So that meant I had to take off from here at roughly 1335, 1340, which means preparation for that began at about 12 o'clock. I would come back here at something like 320 or so. By the time the degree finished, it was 430. My lunch was finished. Actually, my lifestyle changed. I stopped having lunch. <laughs> and, and, and the fat bounder Daniel Delbasi, my flight test engineer, would see me off at 1.30 in time for lunch. <laughs> and he says, I'm a Frenchie. I have to have my lunch. So he was in time for lunch. And there I was. So anyway, this carried on. But in a way, they didn't know what a favor did they did us. And uh, we realized this on day one of our dummy trials over there. The attack direction was an easterly direction. And this is on the east coast of the country. Shar is on the east coast. Sri Arikota range is on the east coast. And the dive direction is in the easterly direction. And the target was placed about maybe a seven, eight hundred meters short of the beach and the coastline itself. So you carried out the attack and went to, over the sea, turned around and came back again. But going in the afternoon, the sun had passed its zenith. So it was behind us. That was the best conditions for taking photograph. It is unbelievable how beautiful those pictures came out with the film. And we needed that because many times the cinetheodolites did not work. Wow. So, so, so we had to, so we had to go back to photogrammetry and photogrammetry. Once this happened, then later on, they say, Hey guys, do you want some other time? You said, no, no, we're very happy with 1400. We'll continue. <laughs> but this was such a boon. They didn't know what a favor they'd done us by insisting on 1400. But we realized that on day one, because the pictures that came out were so beautiful that uh, it's unbelievable. And I don't know if the pictures are still retained here, if the film is still retained, but they, they're archival, they're of archival value. So we started mm -hmm. off and we said, we'll, the first weapon we'll drop is a practice free fall weapon. That's the simplest. Next would be a level retard practice bomb. Then we'll get down to the heavy weapons provided we achieved some level of success here. So after I don't know how many sorties we did. I had gone crazy going round and round and round and round and round over there. And finally, we said, I think we're good to go and drop a bomb. 
So the day we said we are good to go and drop a bomb, we got these bombs loaded up on the aircraft. A little before that in the morning, your dad said, I am going there. So the boss carried eight flags. I was carrying eight practice bombs, four under each practice carrier on each wing. And uh, so I would do some practice dummy run and then drop eight bombs. So your dad got himself into a helicopter, carried eight flags. And he carried two chumchas with him who had a tape and all that to measure the distance. <laughs> and this helicopter team went to Shri Kota. And they had one little walkie-talkie set with them. And so I got ready to go. So Mr. Daniel comes and tells me just before I was to shut the canopy and start. He says, you get the bomb in less than 10 meters. I give you a bottle of champagne. <laughs> that was a good incentive. So I said, Daniel, if I get it less than one meter, what do I get? He said, you get a crate of champagne. <laughs> so saying this, he got down the ladder, took away the ladder and went away. So I started up and I went there. It was a beautiful day and everything went like clockwork. And I dropped the first bomb. I think your dad called up and said, hey, you got the pin. I didn't think I got it right. So anyway, I, there was no talking over there because I was too busy noting down things and so on and so forth. And so were they putting the flags there, marking one to eight, measuring the distance and so on and so forth. So we came back, landed. So by that time, the news had come across. The pin itself, the center of the target, was a meter in diameter, in radius. This bomb had chipped the pin. It was a concrete pin. It had chipped the pin. It was a 90 centimeters. My goodness. So, <laughs> so I came to the fat mound and I said, where's my crate of champagne? <laughs> so I must say, nice of him. He said, wait. He organized at the Ashoka Hotel a lovely evening where he called every single airman also who worked on that project. And he hosted in the sense, Sajam hosted it for us. That was very, very good. And so things moved from there. They moved at a fairly decent pace. So there were lots of things to be done. First, the ranging, first was dropping this. Ranging options have to be used with a radio altimeter, the laser and so on. Then we went to the retard bomb and then we went to various other bombs. In between, we kept having our glitches when Smiths, I don't know what they did, but the bombs suddenly stopped going the way they had to go. He said, hey, there's something wrong. He said, why? I said, I can see that I am not at the correct distance. I can see and make out I'm not at the correct distance. So, yeah, how can you? I said, no, but I'm telling you. And sure enough, that was it. So then they sent two engineers from there who came, sat here. They sat here for six months. They sorted it out. And then we went. Then somewhere in between, something, I said, you guys have done something. So what have we done? I said, can I squeeze the trigger and the bomb goes? Whether the bomb, if it's fitted on the pylon or if not, as long as the release pulse goes, the mode must change over from weapon aiming to navigation. But it's changing over through another mode. So how do you know? I said, I saw that display. So what do you mean you saw the display? I said, I saw it. So well, how long did you see it? A quarter of a second. So, so they looked at me, <laughs> this guy said, I'm telling you I saw it for a quarter of a second. So, so they turned, they ran the film. And sure enough, I said, now count the number of frames. We were filming this at 16 frames per second. It was a standard photo film. And 16 frames is a normal speed at which you film it. And sure enough, it came up one, two, three, four. In the fourth frame, it started. The display started fading out. So then they said, and that's when your dad said, you know, that's enough time for all kinds of thoughts to go through the mind. Have I got the switch selection right? Have I done something wrong? What have I done? It's not right. So then, so all these, this was part of developmental activity. It went through. So this carried on. And eventually, we had the aircraft ready. And... 
initial operations, though it did get delayed, but that didn't really matter because HAL manufacture also got a little delayed. And then the first aircraft started rolling out. And I was, when the first aircraft did roll out, HAL did not have a pilot qualified to fly that aircraft. <sighs> so I was loaned to HAL on a day-to-day basis, half-day basis. In the morning, I would work at AST. Afternoon, I'd go and fly test over there and go back. So I was loaned to them for the first three, four aircraft. By then, Papa Shok had got himself his qualification and then he was doing it himself. And so they uh, so they, they tapped you then to raise the first squadron of these aircraft. That's right. That's right. And, well, so what did that involve, you know, different from uh, the other classical Jaguar squadrons? I presume uh, a lot of different training, different tactics. Uh, more than the tactics, the training. Tactics remain the same whether you use the old system or the new system. But the training changed. A wee bit of the tactics also did change, but the training changed a little. And that was most satisfying, most satisfying. Because uh, when I used to get these guys together and run classes for them, some of the engineers were also quietly sneaking at the back and sit and listen, <laughs> which was good. But the point is that the guys got to understand the logic and the philosophy of it. Had Because I had, had perforce had to go through and understand the logic of how things work or why they worked in a particular manner or why they should work in that manner. And if they don't, what happens? or why you must follow a certain sequence of switch selections. If you do not, how you can enter a different mode and so on. And you had to understand that because if you did not understand it, you would be in deep trouble. At this stage, I don't know if I should tell you this anecdote. But <laughs> I Please do I that's, that's what we're here for. <laughs> we had a chief test pilot by the name of Group Captain I.S. Sandhu, and he had a bit of a grit accent. Well, that's all right. And he said, Ajit, I think I should fly this aircraft. Yeah, please do. Now, on this aeroplane, the way it was configured is that any time, anywhere, if you wanted to know how far was your home base, you just had to hit one button on the head down comment, which says base one. Tuck to take you back to your point of origin. You press the same button, it will take you to your primary diversion. You press the same button again, it will take you to your secondary diversion. You press it again, it came back to one. There was sequential selection button. But when you did that, you had handed over control of your main system from the Sajan system to the Ferranti system. Mm. Now to go back to it, you had to go back here. Pressing here wouldn't get you anywhere. <laughs> this logic had not unfortunately been explained to him to be fair he hit base to see how far he was now he couldn't come out of it <laughs> oh my <laughs> so he, he omitted omitted going one two three 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 till his fingers were sore from pressing the same button <laughs> he, he, he came and landed he said never again <laughs> You know, now I'm getting a sense that, uh, you know, the transition from the aircraft you all were flying previously to this aircraft was almost like going from an old push button Nokia to a smartphone. Well, you know, it was for the Air Force, uh, you know, a generational change in terms of avionics and electronics and intelligence in the cockpit. And... Yeah, absolutely. So he came back. Never again will I touch that aircraft. (laughs) Guys who have not yet stopped laughing are the engineers. Because when they were going through the tapes to see, all they saw were switch selections. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. (laughs) So, So you needed to understand the logic. If you didn't understand the logic, this will happen. So even to a squadron stick and throttle pilot 
he had to understand the logic. And these were pilots, who, a lot of them or all of them came from the Jaguar fleet or did you also have people coming in from other aircraft? Uh, yes, sir. it was 27 squadron, which is the old hunter squadron that converted. So I got eight guys. The composition was eight guys came to me from the old Jaguar guys. So they knew the system of the aircraft. They didn't know the Darren. Four guys or five guys came from Hunter Squadron. That is the CO and four other guys. And I was the outsider put in over there. So that was the composition of the squadron. Of Fourteen people. There. And we built it up from there. And it was a very, very satisfying job. We hit a tragedy in June of this happened, the squadron started forming up in 85. We had a bit of a tragedy in June of 86 when the CO went into the ground. So oh. we lost him. Night flying accident. Wow. So that was sad. Disorientation? Yes. Wow. Yes. But other than that, it was a delightful process of setting it up. And then in October of 86, they made a wing commander out of me and I came back to AST. But in that one year, or a little over a year, we set up the squadron. The squadron was good to go. But it was still at IOC standard. And uh, 16th squadron, when you commanded, uh, that was after that, is it? That, yeah, so I came back to AST, then the brass tax madness hit the country for six, uh, seven months. And then I went to staff college. And after staff college, I went into over 16 squadron. And 16 squadron was on the Darren Jaguar at that time? Yes, it was complete Darren Jaguar. How was it uh, to you know come back to the aircraft that you had kind of stood up as a, the first IOC squadron and to see how other people had taken that system and exploited it and were using it. and Yeah, so some of the things they, over a period of time, had learned and learned to exploit it better. I mean, they they found shortcuts to, you know, it's just like operating a computer. You have a shortcut and you get the same thing. They'd figured that out. And there were some which they simply couldn't understand the logic for it till I explained it to them all over again. So it was very, very good and interesting. But uh, the one thing that stood out was that the system was robust and it stood where it had to stand, which was very good. And end result of that was that they developed on it further. And for, I don't know whether it is for lack of finding another name, they called it only Darren II. <laughs> some time later they've gone further and they're calling it Darren 3 3 that's right yes <laughs> but to so therefore to come back to Darren 1 I mean that time it was just called a Darren system but it, it it did what it had to do and it did it well and that was the nice part of it really uh, amazing success story of us working with multiple partners, but anchoring a project, defining the requirements, making it come together. Yes, that was very good. That that I thought was very, very good. But it had its own spin-offs also. I'll come to the spin-offs later, but some of the other things that happened, that these practice bombs were practice bombs. <laughs> Each of these bombs had its own tail. So then came the live bombs. The live bombs, we did the trials with the forward throw tables of a thousand pound retard bomb with a British tail unit. But the bomb that was going to be used by the squadron was a bomb with the Indian tail unit. Oh my. <laughs> Which had different tables. So similarly, the free fall bomb. So the guys so came back. So what rubbish is this? It doesn't go where it's supposed to go. <laughs> it told me now. I said, yeah. So I said, let's go. So we, next time when we went to Jaisal, this was with the live bomb with the free fall unit. So the guys were loading up the bomb. 
I said, this is not the correct tail unit. So of course, this is the tail unit. I said, this is not. This is not the tail. So how do you know? I said, I can see and look and make out the shape. It's a different shape tail unit. So, but this is mark so and so. I said, you can call it what mark you want. But this is not the tail unit with which I've done the trials and cleared. That's it. So now everyone is scratching his head. What do we do? So whilst all this was going on, we went through the bomb dump. And suddenly I found the tail units which are there. I said, what is this? Is this the British one? No, no, this is the Indian one, but so-and-so mark. I said, this is the tail unit. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not, I said, this is the tail unit. So while this argument was going on, a couple of months went by. I got posted back to AST from command of 16 squad. Now when I came here, I was in a position to say, you guys, you mixed up some, either the nomenclature or the tail unit. But whichever way it is, you're giving the wrong tail unit. You give them this tail unit. It'll work. Yeah. So, and I was in a position to say, if you want, we'll do trials over here. I said, okay, how many bombs do you want to drop? I said, 16 bombs. So we took 16 bombs and each of them went exactly where they had to go. I said, now you guys decide what you want to do, whether you want to change the nomenclature. <laughs> but this is the tail unit which has to be mated with it. Because Correct. the tail unit is what finally determines the forward throw of the bomb. Correct. It's, you know, the aerodynamics are different and the, the parameters in the system need to be computed differently, obviously. So tell me about the command, uh, the command tenure, you know, some of the interesting um, missions, the, particularly, you know, where the, you know, I've heard these stories of how the Darren, you know, in, a, in an exercise, the Darren Jaguar sneaks in, hits the target and gets out before anybody knows what's happening. Just love to hear some nice anecdotes of exploiting the aircraft in an exercise. Oh, yes. It was great fun. So amongst the things we did was we were in Gorakhpur. Now, Gorakhpur did not have a range close by. The closest range that used to be is a, at a place called Kalaikunda and the range was called Dudkundi range. And so we had to go there and go. So then they said, how are you going to go there? Well, we fly and go there and come back. So <laughs> we so we used to go there. So, But that's a different command. I said, listen, don't bring in things like different command, different station, different country. It's the same country, same Air Force. All they have to give me is a nominated block of half an hour. I will tell you when we will be there. I will be there at the on the dot. And we will use that for half an hour and come away and then carry on. How does it matter that range doesn't know that I'm from a different command? Only you know and then you just have to sort out the problem. It took a while sorting it out, but it got sorted out. But uh, you must do this and you must be on time. I said, look, guys, leave that to me. That's my job. You've given me a time, say 10 o'clock in the morning till 10.25 or 10.30. I will be there at 10 o'clock. If you, and I will do a first run attack, which means I will, since you've given me a range block, I know the pin coordinates that I know. So I'm going to do a first run attack. I'm going to come in, go from Gorakhpur, go to my initial point and come in. All you got to make sure is that there's no other guy bloody hanging around, no late, late Latif hanging around saying, hey, I want to do one last pass and so on and so forth. So make sure that the range is clear for me. I will go there, no RT, no talking, nothing. I will go drop my first bomb and out and then we'll talk. Then we'll position ourselves for the second, third, fourth pass and so on. So finally, with great difficulty, it was agreed. It was as if the Pakistan Air Force was now entering Indian Air Force to go and drop the bomb. <laughs> but, but, but that was done and I still remember we dropped this first practice bomb and went away and the RSO would say hey who's that so I said that's me I came at the time you gave me so so wow. <laughs> good fun and so we do a low low navigation up to Dutkundi. if we did four passes we could come back low level but i said hey that's that's not worth it 
I said, let's carry eight bombs and guns. So we do four level retard, four dive, two, three gun passes, and then we'll come back high level. Which is what you would have done in an actual mission, right? You would have done a high, low, high or... Whatever. But mm. in an actual mission, you'd perhaps carry just one weapon. Here right. we were carrying different types of weapons. I said, well, this is practice. We need to practice. Right. So we'll do four passes, level passes with a retard bomb. Then we'll do four passes with a dive bomb. Then we'll do four passes with the gun and then come back. So then they said, how can you do it? So why? How can you mix so many weapons? And the bloody aeroplane doesn't know I'm mixing. <laughs> I'm only making switch selections to select a level retard bomb, dive bomb, and then guns. So again, that went through went through the standard hassles of yay, what is that? So I said, let's sort sort this out. Bureau bureaucracy has to be sorted out bureaucratically. So I asked my AOC. I said, so would you like to come with me? To do what? I said, we'll do all this. So you, so Raj was the AOC. He said, come with me, we'll go. Right. So I put Raj in the front cockpit, me in the back, and we went as we did this. Four level retard, four dive bombs, four gun passes, and then come back. Came back. Hey, that was good. I said, now stop putting spanners in the works and let us do it. So <laughs> it was great fun doing that. Then began, then came a time our op space was Jamnagar. And it was Jamnagar because our primary target, I guess I can talk to it now, was Sheriff Hazard, which is Karachi. Oh, right. So, so the chief, Ali Behra was the chief. He came and he says, Ajit, talk to me about Sheriff Hassan. I told him. So he said, do you have anything to say? I said, yes. I said, I can go drop a weapon there. No problems. But not me, not my grandfather. Nobody has flown over the sea at night. And if you want us to do a drone attack, it has to be a transit over the sea at night. And we've never done this before. So he looks at me, he says, who stopped you? So that took the wind out of my sail. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful can-do attitude. Yeah. Yeah. This was in the AOC's office. And the AOC is someone who, who's a dear friend of yours also, Trevor Osman. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at Theo, I looked at Polly. I said, sir, give me three weeks. I'll work out a syllabus and give it to you. And I'll tell you when you come. So... I did that. I gave him a syllabus. The syllabus got approved. Amongst the things we'd said is that if we've got to do night into the sea, three, four things we need to do. One is we'll start at three or four in the morning so that should somebody eject, as time goes by, it's only going to get brighter for rescue work. Second is that the Navy has got to be uh, involved in it. I said, no, you don't worry about sending a Chetak helicopter. He can't land deep into the sea. He can't even go that far deep into the sea. Because we used to go 150 to 180 nautical miles into the sea. And I said, the Navy will have to have their ships in that area and so on. So, or tell the Navy that this is what is happening and keep your ships on a watch. And then, of course, we went there and we started. So the first day we did it, Jamnakar was in uproar. People from town thought war is going to break out. <laughs> at, the air force, at the air force station, people said, hey, what's happened? Is the, has the balloon gone up? This, that and the other. Why so many aircraft take off at night and so forth? We did that whole syllabus. We went through it. That was good fun. What was it like to fly, uh, you know, at night, 50 feet, 100 feet, whatever, 80 feet above the water? Over the sea? Scary. Scary. But over the time, we got used to it and we were comfortable about it. And as you turn around and come back, 
from 80 miles, you could see that Nalia lighthouse blinking slowly and say, ah, there's Nalia. Mm. So, so, we can do that. <laughs> so, that is how it was. So, we trained the entire squadron for maritime work. I'd like to talk to you the last little bit I did in AST before I went, and that was re-engineering of the AM32. You see, what happened was the Indian Air Force wanted a replacement for the packet and the caribou and all these aircraft, and so they got themselves the AM32. And they wanted the Indian Air Force for some reason has got this mania of more power and more power and more power. They were enormously powerful engines. Now they found that the AM36 couldn't who's had wing-mounted engines which were below the wings simply couldn't manage it. So they had to mount. The reason they couldn't manage it because with powerful engines, they needed a bigger prop. And the prop didn't have enough clearance from the ground. So they mounted these engines on top of the wing. And these engines, as compared to the AN-12 engines, they're a derivative of the AN-12 engines, but they had a prop which was five inches bigger in radius, which means 10 inch diameter larger in diameter and it was mounted on top and enormously powerful and therefore enormously noisy engines and they were carrying on and they were shaking themselves loose then the air force was going to retire the an-12 and they found that they had the airframes would go but between the engines that they had they had something like 450,000 hours left residual hours left on the engines so if mounted on a two engine aircraft, you would have about 225,000 aircraft hours, which is quarter of a million aircraft hours. It's a hell of a lot. Uh-huh. So Marshal Jayal said, why don't you re-engine the AN-32 with the AN-12 engines? So that was, a, that means you're bringing a less powerful engine onto this aircraft. So naturally there'll be loss of performance and so on. So anyway, so there were a couple of modifications that needed that the AN-32 engine had a full range governor which they fitted on this and the first aircraft was ready with these two engines. And uh, so we started flying it. That's the time the horror tale started emerging. This was silent. Can you imagine from that noisy aeroplane, when I say silent, it was a lot quieter. So then we did so we did some digging work. And when we dig, dug a little deeper, we found that the noise that was happening was because the prop tips were supersonic on the big engine. <laughs> and whenever supersonic flow decelerates to some sonic, it goes through a shock wave. And so the noise was being caused because of the interaction of the prop tip eddies with the fuselage. <laughs> oh my goodness. And uh, how did you discover this? You didn't have a wind tunnel or something like that in which to do it, I presume. No, 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 but it worked out. We had brilliant flight test engineers with us who worked out. And then we found that that is what was causing it. So with the AN-32, the original AN-32, you can put as much of padding and so on and so forth you want. It's not going to reduce the noise because it is a prop tip eddies interaction. And the moment you put a smaller prop, this stop. So the first thing that occurred to me is I said, hey guys, whenever a supersonic flow decelerates, it decelerates via a shock wave. And a shock wave only causes a lot of drag. Now, if we don't have the shock wave and we're not going to have so much drag, is it going to make any difference to the overall drag of the aeroplane? Answer in one word is yes. So the question is how much? And it emerged. This aircraft with the less powerful engines, but a cruise power setting used to cruise faster than the other one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All that energy loss. Not only was it cruising faster, (laughs) not only was it cruising faster, it was sipping less fuel. Oh my. So we started doing things like Bangalore to Delhi non stop, which a standard AM32 never did. 
My goodness. <laughs> so I said, hey guys, what are you guys doing? I said, look, this is the cause. So they became it became less noisy, the vibration levels were lower, she would cruise faster. And the only thing is you lost some performance. So he said, okay, where performance is essential, you use the more powerful engine. Where it is not, like in Bangalore, TTW, Yalahanka, all they were doing is circuits and landings in an empty aeroplane. Correct. They use a silly aeroplane. Yep. Or for that matter, use it anywhere else. But when you want to go to Lay and Thoys, you take that more powerful guy and go. Right. Because from Udhampur till Kanyakumari or from Nalia till Chabua, Bangalore is the highest airfield, 3,000 feet. Right. There is no other airfield at this elevation. So, amazing story. actually wrote a new flight manual. AST did a superb job. We generated a new flight manual. Amazing. And so, it was very, very interesting. You know, you have 6,000 hours, which is very unusual for a fighter pilot. It's uh, just quite exceptional. How many hours on the Jaguar? 1,480, close to 1,500. My goodness. But uh, that time when I left the Air Force and I had 6,000 hours, uh, it all came about because when we were pilot officers, I used to, you know, make sure, you know, put my nose in into saying about my entitlement on travel, this, that, and the other, and so on, so on, leave entitlement and so on. And everybody told me, stop worrying about that. Just worry about flying. I said, don't worry. I will make sure I have the maximum amount of flying. And that's what I did. But I said, I will study every little thing everywhere else. <laughs> and that kept me in good stead. I've taken so much of your time. I cannot thank you enough. It's just been incredible, uh, the material that we've got. Thank you very much for all your service and for spending so much time today. It's just been a tremendous experience. Really wonderful. Thank you. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you, Ganesh. Well, folks, that's all we have time for this week. Join us again next week. In the meantime, sign up for updates at blueskiespodcast.com. There you'll find links to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can also write to us with your comments, questions, suggestions and feedback from the website or to blueskies at prganapati.com. Subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting platform such as Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and even on YouTube. If you like what you heard, Share it with your friends, give us a rating in your favorite podcasting app and write us a review. It will help other people find us. I want to give my thanks to Saurav Chaudhia for our logo and Prithvik for the music. I want to reiterate that all the views expressed here are personal and this podcast has not been approved by or reviewed by the Air Force, Ministry of Defense or any branch of the government. In the meantime, stay safe and Jai Hind.